Uh, Luke chapter 16 is where we'll find our text this morning. And a very familiar passage of scripture here. And uh, you pray for us uh, this morning that God would just help us and, and uh, that we'd be obedient servants. And the Bible here in Luke chapter 16 and verse number 19 is where we'll begin our reading this morning. If you found your place, would you say amen? amen. If you found your place, would you shout amen? amen? Amen. Let's stand together. We'll reverence the Word of God. And the Bible here says, uh, There was a sit certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame." But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then said he, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Father in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful for this day. Thankful, Lord, for the abundance of your blessings. Father, the goodness of your mercy, the depths of your love, Father. Lord, I'm so thankful today for the freeness of your salvation. Lord, I'm thankful today that I don't have to go to this place called hell. I'm thankful today, Lord, that I know the joy of sins forgiven. And I pray, Father, that God, you'd help us today to Receive your word with meekness. God, may we be helped by it. And Lord, no doubt, in a congregation this size this morning, there may be several, Father, that do not know you in a free pardon of sin. Lord, I pray today would be the day they come to know you in salvation. We'll give praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I I'm interested this morning in dealing with, uh, of course, a, a portion of all the scriptures that we read, but I guess uh, the Lord dealt my heart in verse number 28 of this reading. I thought about the rich man who lift up his eyes in hell. I begin to think about the burden of the rich man and how things changed on that side of eternity and how all of a sudden 
of the rich man got concerned about the souls of others. All of a sudden, the rich man became a missionary. All of a sudden, the rich man got interested in gospel preaching. All of a sudden, the rich man found himself interested in seeing that somebody else was told the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought about his request there in verse 28. Really, you have to go back to verse 26 to get the full context. But there the rich man finds himself in the torments and the flames of hell. And all of a sudden, this one who had laid at his gate and who had simply desired the crumbs that fell from his table. All of a sudden this rich man is desiring that Lazarus would come and dip his finger in water and cool his tongue. We read about it there. He said, he said and beside all this, uh, between you and us, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Uh, neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. Uh, uh, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Oh, listen. Uh, uh, in verse 28, this is where God has dealt my heart. Uh, he said, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. I'm going to say this, uh, dear friend, this morning, uh, uh, in hell this very moment, uh, uh, the rich man is still there. Uh, and in hell this morning, uh, there are no reunions, uh, and there are no parties, uh, and there's no get-togethers, uh, And uh, but in hell there's a place uh, of torment uh, and fiery torment. Uh, uh, it's a place where the worm dieth not. Uh, uh, it was created for the devil uh, and his angels my friend, uh, uh, but it's a place uh, of t eternal torments. Uh, and my friend, uh, the rich man uh, did not want his brothers to come there. How many times have you heard someone in uh, no doubt ignorance, I pray, say something like this, well, uh, I'll see you in hell or, or we'll We'll have a big time in hell, but my friend, there's no parties in hell this morning. Just weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a place of eternal damnation. It's a place, my friend, that you do not want to go. And we ought to be in the business of telling other people that Jesus saves and you don't have to go to that awful place. Hell's a real place. The Lord spoke more about hell than he did heaven. I believe the Lord did not want any. I know that he did, doesn't want anybody to go to hell. I, I thought about as we looked at these scriptures and uh, as we read this text this morning, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, great, uh, the great difference between these two men, both on this side of eternity and on the other side of eternity, on this side of immortality, one man fared sumptuously every day. I mean, uh, there was no spare at his table. Uh, uh, he ate what he wanted to, uh, and he ate uh, delicately uh, and lavishly. Uh, but the other man uh, had nothing to eat. Uh, uh, he simply desired uh, uh, the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. I'm glad the Lord gave me some crumbs. I'm glad God left some uh, left some crumbs of grace in my way along life's trail and led me to the Lord and, and uh, uh, drew me unto himself. Uh, uh, one man fared sumptuously, the other begged for crumbs. One man was clothed in purple and fine linen and the other man had the rags of a homeless man, uh, if he had any clothing at all. Uh, uh, one lived in a lavish estate. 
and the other was laid at his gate. Oh, I think about, uh, uh, we could use modern day terms uh, and say that the rich man uh, lived in a gated community. Uh, uh, it was a place of wealth and riches uh, and lavish lifestyle. Uh, but at the gate to the entrance of his home uh, uh, was this poor beggar uh, by the name of Lazarus uh, who had nothing in this world, uh, but he had the Lord, my friend. Uh, hey, you can die a pauper uh, and know Jesus uh, and and you're better off than the richest a person in the world that dies lost. No hearse or no uh, no uh, Brinks truck following the hearse at a funeral. Somebody said. Uh, uh, said he was a rich man, Brother Jeff. How much did he leave? Uh, he left it all, my friend. Uh, hey, listen, there's, uh, the wealth of this world is not going beyond the grave. One fared sumptuously, one with clothed in purple and fine linen. One lived in a lavish estate, the other lighted his gate. Uh, one lived like a prince, and the other was a pauper. Oh, one had a prominent family. We know this because in hell, my friend, he desired for Lazarus to go back and to see to his five brethren. He had a big family. They were probably all wealthy and businessmen. They probably got together. But Lazarus seemingly had no one. We know that to be the case because he was left. Like the dear little children every now and then on the news. Uh, you'll see where some little baby's left uh, on the doorstep of some place, uh, abandoned and seemingly forgotten. Uh, and Lazarus was left uh, at the rich man's gate. Uh, he had no family uh, and he had no friends. Uh, he was helpless and homeless. Uh, he was a pauper uh, and he was poor. Do you see the contrast this morning between the rich man and Lazarus? Oh, they didn't run in the same social circles. They weren't a part of the same club. One was rich and the other was poor. But one knew God and one didn't, my friend. Hey, and listen, you can live this life a hundred times over to the wealth of this world. But if you leave here lost and unprepared to meet God, it would have been better that you never had been born. Oh, listen, my friend. I thought about the distinctions. One had a grand funeral. I, I've read this week, I've been, you know, seeing the news about the prince uh, there in England, and, and just, just as an example, no. Well, no mark one way or the other on his character. I'm sure he, he was a good man. And, and, uh, but, you know, he had, the, the, he had the, the whole nation. I mean, he had the funeral of a, of a prince. And, and this man, uh, we know that he had a grand funeral. Uh, and the other man had no funeral. In fact, uh, there's even no record of his burial. Uh, no mention that he was even taken to a potter's field. Uh, but one thing I can assure you, my friend, uh, uh, both men came to the place that God said every man's going to face. Uh, uh, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. Uh, oh, listen, we're not leaving this place uh, uh, one of these days. Uh, uh, we're not leaving this place untouched uh, by the great hand of death. Uh, uh, but the great hand of death uh, uh, came by the rich man's house uh, and it came by the pauper's house. The Bible tells us here, and it came to pass that the beggar died. Oh, listen, poor people die the same as rich. Oh, listen, being rich won't make you spiritual. And poor don't make you spiritual either. Hey, what makes you spiritual is whether or not you've been born again of the Holy Ghost and made a new creature in Christ Jesus. And it came to pass that the beggar died. And, well, glory. And was carried by the angels 
into Abraham's bosom. Do you notice the distinction? No reference to a funeral. No reference to a burial. No reference to a memorial service. I mean, he died and he left this world, but he went to be in the presence of God, if you will, in Abraham's bosom. That's a whole other message. And that was paradise. And I believe now that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And hey, after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and, but that's another message. But do you notice here, uh, and it came to pass that the beggar died uh, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. <laughs> I mean, the Bible's very clear that, that he had a funeral, that, that somebody took time uh, uh, to remember him uh, and to prepare a place for him. Uh, but those honors and those memories uh, were the last things uh, that would ever happen to this rich man uh, of any value because the Bible says, uh, and he lift up his eyes in hell. What a terrible outcome. Oh, listen, my friend. How sad it would be to be raised in a fundamental Bible-believing church and to sit on the pew every Sunday, every Sunday night and Wednesday, to go to youth meetings, youth conferences, to attend Sunday school, to help in the fellowship hall and die lost and go to hell. How sad, how sad. Oh, listen, I, I thought about these men. Both of them died. Both of them fulfilled the scripture in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 29. Uh, and, uh, but mm, glory. Uh, but this rich man did not want his brethren to come to hell. I thought about this as we were pa passing out gospel tracts. Uh, may I say this morning, uh, this is why we preach. This is why we proclaim the Word of God. This is why we pass out gospel tracts. This is why we plead with sinners. Because we do not want anybody to die and go to this awful place called hell. I wonder today, I wonder today, as I look out over this congregation of people, I can't see your heart now, I can't see past your smile or your frown. I can't see past your necktie or, or your shirt collar, but God looks down on the heart. And I wonder, my friend, this morning, if you just take a moment as we preach on this subject, lest they come to this awful place. I wonder and would ask you to survey yourself. Examine yourself. I mean, my friend, is, has God made a change in your life? Was there a place and a time in your life when you bowed before the God of heaven and repented of your sin and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and trusted Him as your Savior? I'm not talking about do you go to church? I'm not asking you today if you've been baptized. I'm not asking you if you've read through the Bible. I'm not asking you if you like to go to church. But do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your sins have been forgiven? I like to quote Brother Mitchell. He was such a clever man and so well read in the Bible. And, and I remember, and I listen, this is going to get a little hard for a minute. Buckle up your seatbelt and shake your little Baptist head. It's going to get a little rough for a minute. But Brother Mitchell used to say this. He said, if your religion's not enough to get you to church on Sunday, what makes you think it'll take you to heaven? The world's dying lost and going to hell. And people play in church and don't have enough about them to get them to come back to church uh, on Sunday night uh, and to, uh, to contribute to the work of the Lord. Uh, hey, listen, my friend, I can assure you uh, that you do not want to go to hell uh, and you do not want your family and your friends to go there. The awful reality, 
the awful reality is that there is a hell. And it's a place of eternal torment. It's a place of punishment. A place of prison for those who rebel against the authority of God's Word. I, I noticed four things this morning. And I started to say I'd be brief, but I'm not going to say that. I want you to think that it's almost over. I don't want the devil to think you can just hold on a little longer. Hey, we may preach till 3 o'clock, my friend. Oh, listen, this is a message that the world needs to hear. But I noticed four things about hell. I noticed the demographics. I thought about that. Demographics is the study of of populations and people. I, I mean, if uh, if Brother Derek was to move to another city and, and he'd want to know what the neighborhood was like where he was moving to, uh, he'd do some research. Uh, he'd want to know what the average income is, uh, what the crime rate's like, uh, what's the ethnicity, uh, uh, what's the job opportunity, uh, uh, what's the real estate market like, uh, who will be my neighbors, where will I live, what's the crime rate like? But I can tell you, my friend, on the authority of God's Word, that this rich man who had everything in this life, he he had the wealth of the world and the privilege of the world, but he died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, and it lets me know that in hell there will be people of all walks of life. You don't have to be poor to die and go to hell. Rich people die and go to hell. There'll be a lot of celebrities in hell. There'll be a lot of famous people in hell. There'll be politicians in hell. There'll be some mommies and daddies in hell. And I hate to say this, my friend, but there'll be some Baptist preachers in hell. There'll be some men that stood behind this pulpit that knew nothing of the saving grace of God and they were charlatans and hypocrites and wolves in sheep's clothing and my friend, they'll die and go to the same place that's called hell that the wino on Walnut Street will go to. No demographics in hell. You see, we think hell is reserved for inmates and drunken people and, and drug addicts and, and people that we sometimes maybe sneer down our uh, self-righteous noses at. But my friend, there'll be people with shirt and ties on in hell. There'll be people in hell. Your neighbors might be there and your friends and family may be there. I don't want anybody to go to this place, do you? Oh, listen, I, I mean the Bible tells us there in that verse of Scripture... And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. I thought about not only is there the demographics of hell, but there's the dimensions of hell. I mean, what I mean by that, by the dimensions. I mean, my friend, this building has dimensions. It's so many feet by so many feet. It's so large. It's a physical, this building's a physical reality. It's full of, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real place. And hell, my friend, is not an idea. It's not a notion. It's not just something to try to manipulate people. It's a physical geographic location where lost people die and go to. And I don't know how big hell is, but I know this much. The Bible says that, mm, glory, hell hath enlarged her borders. Hey, listen, I, I, I'm glad that a preacher one time had enough about him to stand and preach on hell and the Holy Ghost dangled my soul out over the flames of the abyss and God dealt with my heart and said, you don't want to go to that place. Got saved by the grace of God. Got saved, Brother Waters. God did a work in my heart. He, he lifted my feet up out, uh, out of the miry clay and set my feet on a solid rock. And I've been headed for heaven ever since. 
I'm glad the old preacher had enough about him I, that he loved me enough to tell me that I don't want to go to that awful place. Oh, listen, I see the demographics of hell, the dimensions of hell. I notice in verse 24, the destitution of hell. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. Oh, listen. I mean, it's, it's an awful place, my friend. I mean, the, the smoke of their torments ascendeth up forever. It's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a place of outer darkness. It's a place of eternal punishment. It's a place of fiery torments and a brimstone. My friend, nobody wants to find them place, their self in that awful place. We got loved ones that are lost and dying going to hell. We're playing church on Sunday. I'm gonna, I can assure you, my friend, that the rich man did not want his brethren to come to this awful place. I'm going to tell you something, my friend. You don't want your loved ones to go to hell. If there's any message in the Bible that ought to encourage us to be faithful and to be a witness to a lost and a dying world, it's these verses. I see the, the divide of hell there in verse 26. I mean, he's, he's, he's requested Lazarus. Uh, he said, but Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And I want you to notice something about the divide in hell in verse 26. It's an awful thought. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. There's a, there's a divide there. It's a great gulf. It's an expanse. It's something that God has put in place that no man or woman, boy or girl, will pass from one side to the other. I mean, what it's telling me, hey, listen, as, as a tree falleth, so shall it be. Oh, listen, when you leave this world, my friend, and you find yourself in eternity, you'll be on one side of the gulf or the other. That's a sobering thought. I don't know about you, but I'm sentimental. And I'm, uh, as much as I like to travel in reality, I'm really just a homebody. And I tell you, I tell people all the time, and I, I experienced this on my second missionary trip to the Philippines. I, I, I wanted to get home so bad. Uh, and my friend, uh, there was 10,000 miles of ocean uh, up between us. Uh, I, I couldn't have rode myself home. Uh, I couldn't fly myself home. Uh, I was dependent on somebody else uh, to get me back to the house. Uh, and there's no feeling like homesickness. And the only cure for it is to go home. But here, you cannot go home. That's a terrible thought. To me, that's as terrible a thought as the flames of hell. To think that, I, I'm glad I'm not going, but to think that I would find myself in a place where I could not come back out from. I'm going to say one other thing. We've been helping our dear, sweet friend, Sister Mary Huffman, and Mary's 95, will soon be 96 years of age. And she's uh, suffering from a little bit of a dementia. She's an elderly person. I think maybe I'm already suffering it some. I mean, sometimes it's hard to remember what I ate yesterday. And, uh, but you know something? I thought about dementia. There's no dementia in hell. Did you realize that, my friend? It's the one place where dementia would be a blessing. But there's no dementia in hell. Because my friend, the rich man had all of his senses. 
He could see. He had a desire to have his tongue cooled. He remembered Lazarus. He remembered his brethren. He had all of his faculties and all of his memories. And one of the worst things about hell is to know that you didn't have to go. That things could have been different. That you could have been somewhere else. But that will play over and over throughout your mind, throughout all eternity.